Hello guys, I'm Sujat Pathan and once again I welcome you all to this episode where we will have some active learning. This video will cover local anesthesia and regional anesthesia. We'll talk about the anesthesia of the face. So please watch the video till the end. We begin this episode with one simple question. What is the most common symptom in the emergency department? Take your time and make a wild guess. Yes, you are absolutely right. The most common symptom in the emergency department is pain. Pain while we are re reducing that dislocated shoulder, pain with that twisted ankle, pain in the tummy, pain while we are doing arterial gas sampling or pain while we are closure, closing the wound. And management of this pain is our first duty. If you look at the Arkham guidance on management of pain, it divides into three types mild pain moderate pain and severe pain all these patients need to be assessed and treated for their pain within 20 minutes those with mild pain should be reassessed in an hour and those with severe pain should be reassessed in the next 30 minutes apart from the medications we can give oral or IV or IM there are different ways to achieve a good pain control this could lead from procedural sedation and analgesia. It's called as sedation and analgesia. It's not called as conscious sedation. The term conscious sedation in my understanding is an oxymoron because conscious and sedation, you get it? You can do a local anesthesia either by infiltrating or applying something topically. You can do a regional block. Each has its advantages and disadvantages. Procedural sedation and analgesia will make the patient stay in the department for a while. Whereas, again, it can lead to respiratory complications. On the other hand, if you infiltrate topical anesthesia, if the wound is too large, you may put in a larger dose and can give rise to toxicity or it may obliterate the anatomy while you are working on it. Furthermore, if the wound is contaminated, you will push in the contaminate contaminants inside or if there is a localized infection then the anesthesia may not work at all that is why regional anesthesia takes the best place over here an understanding of the anatomy makes it very easy to administer regional anesthesia if you are worried about the safety of its use you can learn doing this anesthesia using ultrasound guided techniques let us begin with the first question of the day today you decide to locally infiltrate a wound with lignocaine before washout and closure. Which of the following facts stands false for lignocaine? First, the maximum dose of lignocaine without adrenaline to be used is 3 mg per kg body weight. The pKa of lignocaine is 7.9 and hence its onset time is shorter than bupiacaine. The concentration of lignocaine in EMLA is 2.5%. Lignocaine leads to vasoconstriction. The mechanism of action is sodium channel blocking. Take your time and make a wild guess. You are correct. The option number four, lignocaine leads to vasoconstriction, is the false fact. Remaining all four facts are true. There are different anesthetics which we can use. Lignocaine, bupiocaine and prilocaine. Prilocaine has become obsolete but it is a major component of the topical application EMLA. Prilocaine was used for bias block using IV regional anesthesia, but now it is going off the fashion. Lignocaine has a quicker onset time and that is related to its lipid solubility. The pKa is nothing but the pH at which the anesthetic agent becomes 50% ionized and 50% unionized form. The ionized form is the one which diffuses into the tissue. Lipid solubility, that means these drugs are lipid soluble and that is when the onset will be happening. If the more they are lipid soluble, the quicker the onset time. The concentration of EMLA is, for those who don't know what EMLA is, it's a topical ap applicant cream which com consists of lignocaine and prilocaine, 2.5% each. It is contraindicated in patients who are susceptible to methemoglobinemia because of prilocaine. It cannot be applied to open wound. If there is an open wound, the alternative is the LAD gel, lignocaine, adrenaline and tetracaine gel. The other option is tetracaine. 
Tetracaine is the one which we use commonly while examining the eye. It's quick onset and leads to vasodilation as well. Lignocaine in addition leads to vasodilation and is quick onset. So both lignocaine and tetracaine are good to be used. Next we move on to last. What is last? Last is local anesthesia, systemic toxicity. Systemic toxicity, systemic toxicity. It affects your brain. It affects your brain and your heart. It affects your brain and your heart leading to seizures, coma, seizures, coma. It can lead to arrhythmias and death. So this is systemic toxicity and that is where the antidote for local anesthesia toxicity is your intralipid. The moment you give the intralipid, it dissolves in the blood, pulls out the local anesthesia from these, from these systems and later on it will be metabolized through the mitochondria and may be deposited in the adipose tissue. Let us look at question number two here. You're planning to do a ring block anesthesia on an 18 year old patient's little finger to close a wound. The patient has no comorbidities and has no allergies to any anesthetic agent as he had a wound suture in the past. The patient is seated comfortably with his hand on the table. You start the procedure and infiltrate 2.5 ml of 1% lignocaine. The patient suddenly collapses and recovers within few seconds while you press the buzzer. What is the cause of collapse? Lignocaine toxicity, lignocaine allergy, pain, WPW syndrome, sodium channelopathy. You guessed it right, it is pain. Remember to make the patient lie down, otherwise they will undergo pain of the injection and may have a vasovagal phenomenon. The other options are incorrect. Lignocaine toxicity will happen with a larger dose more than 3 mg per kg body weight without adrenaline or more than 7 mg per kg body weight with adrenaline. Lignocaine allergy can, is not the answer because the question says that there is no allergy. And as this is not a cardiology lecture, WBW syndrome and sodium channelopathy is out. But remember, all local anesthetics acts via sodium channel blocking. So how do we reduce the pain of the procedure which will lead to reduction of pain? Think about it. Take it like this. I plan to go on a road trip down the countryside. I'm going on a bicycle. I'm going to add some extra buffer because things can change. I'll take in some warm clothes because it gets colder in the UK. I will be traveling through those narrow lanes straight on my path, slowly taking pauses and avoiding distractions. That means I will always stay on the top of my game. So remember this, this story to remember how to reduce the pain on the pain of injecting local anesthetic agents. Add a buffer. Sodium bicarbonate when added to lo local anesthesia 1 is to 10 ratio it will lead to reduced pain. The reason is the local anesthetic agents are highly acidic and you add a buffer and that reduces the acidity and thereby it reduces the pain. Next I said was I'll take in some warm clothes. So lignocaine from the fridge will give more pain than that kept in the normal temperature. You go slowly, take intermittent pauses or give pulse doses. Rather than infiltrating at an angle, go perpendicular to the skin while you're doing regional anesthesia. That will reduce the pain. The concept here is when you're going perpendicular, you're irritating many more receptors of pain than by a single perpendicular needle. Distract the patient. I said avoiding distractions while I'm riding. So distract the patient while you're doing this and if necessary you can apply a topical agent that means you stay on the top of the game. Let's move on to question number three. A 76 year old male is in the emergency with 16 centimeter laceration on his scalp. His CT is normal, bleeding is well controlled. You plan to close the wound by infiltrating local but your consultant feels that it would be advisable to do regional blocks instead. Laceration extends from just above the temple to the occiput, which nerve is not supposed to be blocked, supratrochlear, zygomaticotemporal, lesser occipital, greater occipital, auricular temporal. Here we are going to look at the nerve supply of the scalp. If you place your finger 
at the midpoint of the upper orbit that's your supra orbital nerve just medially to it is your supratrochlear this will supply the medial portion of the scalp right up to the midline the supraorbital will supply further further back on the scalp going a little bit lateral to the canthus about 1 to 1 and a half centimeter lateral that's your zygoma meeting the lateral wall of the orbit near the temple zygomatico temporal that supplies this part of the scalp further down just a centimeter ahead at the temp at the temple that's your auricular temporal nerve that will block the temporal area behind the head behind the mastoid to the occiput if you draw a straight line and divide it into three parts the most medial point is the place for greater occipital nerve block and the lateral part is the lesser occipital nerve block so if this laceration extends right from here down to the occiput you need to block the greater occipital lesser occipital auriculotemporal and zygomaticotemporal supraorbital or supratrochlear is not needed let us look at in this picture from front to back supratrochlear nerve supraorbital nerve zygomaticotemporal auriculotemporal lesser occipital and greater occipital supplies half of the scalp on that side there is another picture over here let us now look at the nerve supply of the ear this is done in a scissor fashion just like in this image one centimeter above the ear and one centimeter below the ear you infiltrate like a scissor the anterior part of the ear is supplied by the auriculotemporal nerve the posterior part of the upper ear is supplied by the lesser occipital nerve that gets blocked the lower half of the ear is supplied by the greater auricular nerve let us now look at the nerves of the face if i am looking straight at the midpoint of my eye or the orbit is the supraorbital nerve 1 cm or 2 cm below in midline is the infraorbital nerve on the cheek and just below about a cm below the canthus of the lip is your mental nerve just as given in this image this will block halfway from the face to the lateral edge of the face these nerves are branches of trigeminal nerve lastly we'll talk about inferior alveolar nerve remember second premolar second premolar going from the opposite side hitting the rim, uh, ramus and slightly withdrawing and going posteriorly you can infiltrate remember blocking inferior alveolar nerve will anesthetize the half of that mandible including the tongue and if you have used bpo again this can last for six to eight hours another thing to note here is you may if not done properly you may injure the carotid vessels so be careful while doing this and if you are not trained to do it avoid doing this block let us look at last two questions of the video a 10 year old girl comes to the emergency department after falling off a scooter she has abrasions all over the right side of her face as well as deep gaping laceration noted to the medial aspect of her right eyebrow the child is anxious and crying at the thought of being sutured her parents are at her bedside and they are concerned about their daughter's experiencing too much discomfort which of the following procedure is most indicated prior to repairing the laceration local infiltration that will obliterate the area conscious sedation not a good choice in a 10 year old girl supratrochlear nerve block i think this is the better answer topical anesthetic applying emla or lat well supratrochlear nerve block will be an option which will not obliterate the anatomy and will give nice pain control let us now look at question number 5 a 25 year old intoxicated man is brought to the emergency department after a knife fight he has no significant past medical history 
he has multiple lacerations to his face including the eyebrow, forehead, periauricular region and jaw. Bilateral, supraorbital, supratrochlear nerve blocks are performed and multiple other facial lacerations are repaired after local infiltration with lignocaine. The patient is getting prepared for discharge when he suffers a seizure. He is given intramuscular lorazepam and the seizure activity abates. Which of the following is the next best step in the management of this patient? IV lipid emulsion, IV lorazepam infusion, IV hypertonic saline, IV vitamin B6, IV thymine, then dextrose. Yes, you guessed it right. It is IV intralipid emulsion. Remember, we talked about lipid solubility. Intralipid is an antidote for local anesthesia systemic toxicity. Let us look at the other options. When will you consider giving IV vitamin B6 in a seizure patient? Yes, it's an antidote for isoniazide toxicity. Isoniazide is a drug which is used in TB patients. And if overdosed on it, pyridoxine is the antidote of choice and isoniazide toxicity can give rise to seizures. When would you consider using hypertonic saline in a seizing patient? It can be used in a seizure patient if it is due to a post-traumatic head injury causing raised intracranial pressure and thereby the seizure it can be used to lower down the pressure. Secondly, it can also be used in hyponatremia induced seizure where we use hypertonic saline to, ready to take care of the seizure. When would you consider using IV thymine then dextrose in a seizing patient if the seizure is related to the alcohol abuse? Thank you for watching till the end. Stay safe. Help your patients getting better care and better pain control. Stay blessed. Peace.